Let's pray. Lord, this is a hard word. Who can hear it? Israel knew you by name, and they were zealous for you, and they did not obtain what they were seeking. Only the elect have obtained it. I pray, Father, that this whole room would be elect of God, foreknown, chosen by grace. In other words, Father, help everyone in here to believe. And I mean truly believe to the core, like Abraham. Help us to hear the voice of Jesus as sheep hear the voice of the shepherd. Help us to see your glory, not, not with physical eyes merely, Father, but with the eyes of our hearts, that they would be enlightened and opened and that we would see and truly see and hear and truly hear and understand and by way of that be able to be healed before you. Help us to understand your word, not just intellectually, not just to know the facts of it, but to get it, Father, to our inner man so that it would change us in a life-altering way. And I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I want to read again the last part of what Dakota just read. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Romans 11. We're going to begin in verse 7 this morning. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they can't see and bend their backs forever. I asked myself, why, why did God include this? Why is this here for the people of God all through the ages? There are so many things Jesus did and so many things that he said that John said the whole world wouldn't be able to contain all of his works in one book. This is a pretty small book, relatively. And of all the things God could leave behind for us, why leave this word? I said in my prayer, Father, this is not an easy word. Who can hear it? The disciples asked that same thing to Jesus on occasion. This is a hard word. Who can hear it? I believe there are two reasons for why it is left for us. The first and most obvious reason is that Paul needed to answer the objection of the reader concerning God's justice and his faithfulness. When you look on the nation of Israel and the majority of them didn't make it. The majority of the people in covenant with God, in proximity to God, who knew his name, who he called and formed in the wilderness and adopted as his son and raised up and sent all the prophets to them, the majority of them are completely and totally lost. And the first and most natural reason for why this text is here is to answer what happened. I mean, what in the world went wrong? 
That's the first reason. And it is to defend the name of God against the assumption of man that would attribute any guilt on in any of this to the name of God, which Paul has repeatedly said, is there injustice on God's part? Was God unfaithful? Because Israel w- was unfaithful. No, let God be true and every man a liar. All through this letter, the name of God is delivered from the objection of man that would put the guilt in the court of God concerning what happened to Israel. So huge, this is all in here to answer what in the world happened. But it's also here. And it's also recorded, not just to record the history and to answer the objecting reader, but it is here as a warning to me and you. I'm reading this word of what happened here with Israel. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David is praying, Lord, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they can't see and bend their backs forever. I'm reading that and I'm praying, God, don't let me have a heart like Israel that was so unbelieving that you would in turn harden my heart and close my eyes completely. Oh God, don't let me be like Israel. Let me tell you why I believe and know this is a warning because if you drop down to verse 17, Paul reveals this isn't just about telling us what happened so we know the facts, but so that we would learn the facts and learn from the facts. And we would look forward and say, I won't be like them. What went wrong with them? They were the Bible people. They were in the synagogues. They had the word. They knew the stuff. And they're lost. I read that. That's, that's me. I was born with a Bible in my hands. Probably ruined the pages in a matter of minutes. But in verse 17, he says, if some of the branches were broken off, because Jesus grew up in, in this grew up into Israel, this vine that received all of its life from Jesus. And Israel grew up, and it was Israel, and they were flourishing, and they were green. But he says, but they were cut off. He says, if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, listen to this, do not be arrogant toward the branches, If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Well, they were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So, it's a concluding kind of word. So do not become proud, but fear. If God didn't spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. That's written to me. That's written to you. This is written to the Gentile. If God didn't spare those who came from the physical body of Abraham and his blood was coursing through their veins and they could trace back their ancestry to one of the 12 tribes, and they'd been circumcised, and they kept the law as best they could, if he didn't spare them because of their unbelief, he says, don't be proud. Is there any room for pride in here? Because we're sitting in a saved condition. No, he says, but rather fear, because if he didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare the unnatural branches that were grafted in. Now, look at this text. Look at verse 7. He says, Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. That's a haunting word. Now, what were they seeking? Were they seeking money? Were they seeking fame? Were they seeking fortunes? Were they seeking pleasures? 
That's not what the text indicates that they were seeking. Let me read to you four verses, or three of them and then one generally in this context that tells us exactly what they're seeking. Number one, they were seeking God. Chapter 10 and verse 1, Paul says, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. That's a earnest hunger, driving after, desire. It's a pursuit of, they had pursuit for God. They were seeking him. They were seeking righteousness. They wanted to be right, just like everybody. Anybody that excuses themselves, Anybody that presents themselves in one way, it is because they want to be right. I want to be right. But Paul says, being ignorant of the righteousness from God and seeking to establish their own, they didn't submit to God's righteousness, but they were seeking righteousness. Seeking God, seeking righteousness, they were seeking God's law. He says this in chapter 9 and verse 31, Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Trying to be lawful. Seeking God, seeking righteousness, seeking the law. And generally all through this text, they were seeking salvation because that's the subject. They didn't get it. That's his main thing. I, I am grieved to my core. My conscience bears me witness that I have unceasing sorrow in my heart because Israel, I would wish myself cut off for them if only they could be saved. They were seeking salvation. Paul says Israel didn't obtain what they were seeking. They were seeking God, righteousness, the law, salvation. They did not obtain God. They did not obtain righteousness. They did not fulfill the law, and they didn't get salvation. Now, some of them did. Some of them did. When Paul says Israel didn't obtain what they're seeking, he means Israel generally. Here's how I know that. Because look at how he breaks up Israel into two parts in the preceding or in the the following clause. They didn't seek what they were, or they didn't obtain what they were seeking. And then he says, the elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. Now, how do I know that when he says the elect obtained it, that he's talking about elect among the Jews? Because in verse 5, he uses the exact same word to describe the present remnant of Jews that were elect. If you look at verse 5, he says, So too at the present time there is a remnant chosen. That word chosen there is the exact same Greek word, no different at all. Is the, there is a remnant chosen by grace or elect by grace. So in verse 5, he says, Among Israel, right now, if you were to look out... You know, the big question was, did God reject his people? He says, no, I'm a Jew. And haven't you read about the Jews in Elijah's day, how only 7,000 of them were saved? And even now, there's a remnant that's chosen by grace, meaning right now there are Jews that are saved, like Peter and Paul and John and the Jews in the diaspora and the Jews worshiping in synagogues as Christians around the ancient world. So when he says... Israel didn't get what they were seeking. He says the elect did. The rest were hardened. So there is a portion of them that got it. Here's the question. Why'd they get it? What made them elect of God? What made Israel chosen by God? Was it that they were unique? Was it that they were better? Was it what's been the answer from the beginning of Romans all the way through? How are you made righteous before God? In one way or another, every single one of these lessons in Romans is going to come back to this one main theme, believe in God more. Believe in him more. 
Make it such that your life is a testimony to your faith in the name of Jesus, such that everywhere you go, everything that you do, it's born out of a faith in Jesus. I go forward out of my faith in Jesus. I live for a future day out of my faith for Jesus. I conduct myself in this way and not that way because of my faith in Jesus. I have a confidence today because of my faith that God raised him up out of the grave. 2,000 years ago, and I serve a risen Savior, and he's in the world today. They were justified, they were elect, they were chosen by the grace of God because they believed, and the way we know that is because chapters earlier, in chapter 5, Paul says, therefore, since we now have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen, through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So if you're in Christ this morning, don't doesn't matter what you've done, even yesterday, there is grace around you, behind you, above you, beneath you. We stand in it. I had a whole lesson on that back in Romans 5. We're immersed in it. We're encompassed in grace, and it's because there's blood that's surrounding us, which is the perfect blood of Jesus Christ, who's our propitiation before the Father. And how do we have access into this place of grace that doesn't exist anywhere else? Faith. So when he says there's a present remnant chosen by grace, and when he says there is a chosen remnant who did receive it. What's he talking about? What group? The Jews who believed. Now, this morning, I want to talk about the rest of them. That's the one that I want to talk about. Because he says, the elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. When he says the rest, that's the group I have in mind. And the reason why is because it's here, for one. That's where Paul goes with the subject. And because that's most people. I, I want it, it helps me to get to the bottom of what differentiates one person from the next such that one is elect, one is hardened. Unbelieving, unseeing. What is the difference between them? I want to get to the bottom of that. Because I look forward to that day, I often think of it. I, I will wake up. I'll be taking a nap. Or it'll be first thought on my uh, mind in the morning. Or maybe I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll just think, I'm going to face Jesus one day. What do I want to hear from him? And, and any time I imagine hearing from him, Daniel, I didn't know you. Depart from me. There's a pit that's immediately formed in my stomach and I go to God and say, help me believe more. I, I, I can't even imagine coming before the throne and the sensation that would overwhelm my person knowing for all eternity going forward, I don't get to see ever anything good ever again. I'm going to a place that's bad. That, that fear that Paul says you must have that, that's that. Makes me say, okay, what am I doing today? How am I living today? That's going to inform my behavior more than anything else. And it ought to inform yours. Because we will stand before him. This text is here to help us now while there's still opportunity. While it's still day to make the proper choice Whoever believes in Jesus will not be put to shame. I take great confidence in that. I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm failing. I know that I will always fail to the very end, but I believe in Jesus. I really do, and I love him with all my heart, and I will not be put to shame. Paul, speaking of the future day, says you won't be put to shame. You can take great stock in that. But it's the rest that I have in mind here. Who are they? Now here's my 
the outline for the rest of the lesson. The first two points, we're going to blitz through them. I've, I have three questions to ask about this group, the rest. He says they were hardened. First question is, how'd that happen? Second question is, what does it mean to be hardened? And, excuse me, the first question is, who did this? Second question is, what does it mean to be hardened? And the third question is, how does it happen? So that's the outline. Question number one, who hardens? The answer is, God. Paul says, the rest were hardened. That is passive voice in the Greek, meaning it was done to them. They were hardened. And then he says, as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor. So that's the first point. God does it. Question number two. Now, I hope that that fact alone would intrigue you to say, I want to pay attention to the rest of it. You mean God did that? Well, that's what he says. There is no skirting around that. That's what it says. I'm not going to change that. I'm not ashamed of that. I am going to get to the bottom of what that means. But I would ask you to keep in mind the lesson from last week, which basically boiled down to this. Did God reject his people? By no means. The point of that lesson was God didn't reject his people. God will never reject his people. And God's people rejected him. So when you come into this text where it's like, God did that? When we start to feel real uneasy, you have to keep in mind what we just read. But let's see, what does it mean to be hardened? Well, let's look at this. Here's what it means. It means you can't understand, you cannot see, you cannot hear, and you have no peace. That's what it means. And here's where I get that. In verse 8, <coughs> God gave them a spirit of stupor. Um, in my Greek lexicon, I looked up the word that's used here to see if I could get a more precise definition. And it says the word means stupefaction. And that's all it said. It's like, well, that doesn't help me because we don't use that word. It just basically means the dots aren't being connected. You see this, and it's like, what? That's what it means. God gave them a spirit that was of stupor, like they were stupefied. Just don't get it. That's one thing. It means to be blind because he said God gave them eyes that wouldn't see. And it means to... Be deaf, because it said they had ears that God gave them that wouldn't hear. So they hear the stuff. They could regurgitate it, probably. They could quote it. They could write it down, but it doesn't make any sense at all. They see stuff, but they don't really see it. They hear things, but they don't really hear it. Yes, audibly they heard it, but they didn't hear it. And... They don't have any peace. David says in verse 9, um, let their own table, which is a place of comfort and provision, it's a place of peace, let it become a trap and a retribution. Now the verse before that, see if this sticks out to you. In the psalm that David is quoting this, or that David's saying this, that Paul's quoting, in that psalm, just before this statement, it says, they gave me poison for my food, and sour wine for my drink. Does that ring any bells? And then it says, let their own table become a trap. What do you know of that quote? They gave me sour wine for my drink. Who's that talking about? This is talking about, this is a psalm about the people that committed the greatest sin in the history of the world. They murdered the Son of God. That's what that psalm's about. And then David says, let their, let their own table be a trap. They killed the son of God. They hated him. So this is who he's talking about. This is a, the group. And this is what it means to be uh, hardened. Blind, deaf, dumb, 
peaceless. Let me give you a couple quick examples and then we'll move to the third point of the lesson. Um, some people hear the word of Christ and it doesn't make any sense to them at all. And, 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 and here's how. It's, they'll say, how can Jesus, how can the death of one man, and I've heard this asked in apologetic seminars from the standpoint of the agnostic or the unbeliever who says, how can the death of one man cover the atrocities and the great sins of all men for all time? This doesn't make any sense at all. That's how, that's a spirit of stupor. Or how can this book that has been copied and recopied and hand copied by fallible men for thousands of years maintain so much as a shred of accuracy? So they take it, they say, not interested. Put that away. Or how can God, how can God justify a murderer and say, you get eternal life because you believe in my name, but my atheist grandfather who never heard a fly was the most philanthropic, involved member of the community that this town has ever known, He's going to hell. This doesn't make any sense at all. That's a spirit of stupor. And eyes that don't see. There were some, you know, we, we often think that seeing a miracle would really change things. The world today could just see miracles. How many miracles did they see? And they didn't believe. Though they saw great signs, John says, Though they saw them, they looked at them, they saw the water become wine, the little basket of bread and fish feed thousands. They saw the leper's skin change in an instant. They saw it, but they didn't see it. Jesus said it this way. You see the sign, but essentially you don't get the purpose of the sign. When Jesus fed 5,000, this, the purpose of that wasn't to go on feeding people, or he would have kept doing that because he had the ability to do it. He said to them, you're only here because you had your fill of bread, but here's the real answer. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. That's the purpose of the sign. The person who really saw the sign would have said, I saw the miracle. I know what this means. I need to give my whole life to Jesus. He's mine. I'm going to feed on him all of my days. But some see and they never see. Some hear the words of Christ on the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon that was ever preached. And they don't hear anything any different than maybe something you'd hear from Confucius or the Dalai Lama. It's just another man of wisdom. It's just another sage who's got some advice. And yeah, it sounds pretty good. They see, but they don't see. They hear, but they don't hear. They listen to the arguments, but they don't understand it. That's what it means to be hardened. And here's what Paul says. Paul said, stay with me. God does that. God gave the spirit of stupor. God gave the eyes that wouldn't see. God gave the ears that wouldn't hear. God made the table a trap. Now, the big question is, how does God do that? That's what I'm after. I've thought about this considerably. Because as I see it, I know God does this. He said God does it. God did that. How does he do it? Well, I just start imagining. Well, one way is God could insert a quality or a, character, uh, a characteristic or a trait into the person of a, you know, somebody that would just change their disposition to where the day before they were understanding perfectly and they were seeing great and they were hearing fine and they were walking with the Lord and all of a sudden they just... It's one way you could conceive of it. Um, is that how he did it? Uh, did he just perform a spiritual lobotomy that took away that from them? Another way is God could have sent upon them a spirit of 
delusion, like maybe the spirit of the harassing spirit that he had, that he sent upon Saul in the Old Testament. And Saul was all of a sudden not at peace unless David was playing his music. And it kept him awake at night and it haunted him. Is that how he does it? Did he change their character or did he introduce a foreign spirit? I have four answers and neither one of them are those. And I want you to hear this and learn this and know this. Here's answer number one. In chap, back in chapter 9, we're in chapter 11, but back in chapter 9, Paul brings out by name one person when he first introduces the idea of being hardened. This isn't the first time Paul's talking about being hardened, is it? No, he talked about it back in chapter 9. He says he has compassion on some and he hardens others. And do you remember the person that he specifically named when he talked about the hardening? Pharaoh. Paul brought him out by name. He says, here's a point. Here's, here's a case in point of what I mean by God hardening hearts. God told Moses, I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people of Israel go. So we've got to look at Pharaoh. I want you to hear this. I'm just going to read it and I want you to listen. <clears throat> this is in Exodus 7. God said, when Pharaoh says to you, prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff, cast it down before Pharaoh that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then, then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. The important thing for you to know is, this wasn't a trick. They really did it. Pharaoh's sorcerers really did it. And then notice what the text says. For each man cast down his staff and they became serpents, but Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still, now notice immediately what he goes into right after telling the story. Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. What are you to gather about why his heart was hardened? Well, Pharaoh's men just did the same thing that Moses' men did. In other words, the word of God comes and Pharaoh says, who is this Lord that I should obey him? And now all of a sudden he sees the power of God and he sees the power he's been using all this time. He says, they're pretty much the same. Yeah, my, yours ain't mine, but we both made snakes. And that was the real trick, wasn't it? If you don't think that's what it's saying, let me make this even clearer in the very same chapter. Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile, and all the water in the Nile turned into blood. And the fish in the Nile died, and the Nile stank so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt, but the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. And notice what Moses, who's writing the story, says. He says, so Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he wouldn't listen to them. How did God harden Pharaoh's heart? He hardened his heart by allowing Pharaoh to perceive a parallel power in whatever it is that he had before God came along. And I promise you this, if you are faithful to the task of evangelizing your friends and family in the community, that is going to be one of the chief things. You think you're happy as a Christian? I've got this. I've got yoga. I've got my Eastern mysticism religion. I've got Allah. I've got drugs. I have witchcraft. When we lived down in the Caribbean, I heard some stories that would make you chilled to your bone about people who use witchcraft 
And I'll tell you, they're not using it because there's no power there. They're using it because there is power there. It's one of the main ways God hardens hearts is by allowing there to be other entities that prove to have some degree of power. But here's the thing. Moses' staff ate up the magicians. And there will always be that little thing that those people are going to know there's something a little better about theirs. But mine's still pretty good and I don't want to change. That's one way he hardens. Number two, this is still in Exodus. This is, this is how he hardens hearts. In Exodus 8, after God sent a plague of frogs on the land of Egypt, there are frogs everywhere. They were in your kitchenware. They were in their beds. They were at their feet at the table. They were everywhere. It was a disgusting, horrible plague. Can you imagine a fr a frogs being everywhere? You try to sleep and they're bouncing all over your bed. Can you imagine it? It was awful. Pharaoh wanted it to end and he asked Moses to end it. So Moses did. Now Pharaoh didn't promise I'll let your people go. He just asked him to end it. And Pharaoh ended it. Excuse me, Moses ended it by the power of God. And, and listen to this. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and wouldn't listen to them as the Lord had said. Now he hardened his own heart. And it was in direct response to the Lord granting a breath or a moment of peace and tranquility within Pharaoh's continued sin. And I'll tell you this, you want to know what that means for us today? That means that there are those today who are living at ease. They sleep well. They eat well. They do well. There's money in the bank. And they're living in complete rebellion to God. And you know what they think when you come to them? I don't need anything. I've got everything I need. Why would I need God when I already have what I want? Have you ever had somebody say to you, you made me so mad? And you say, I made you. I didn't realize I had that kind of power. And there's a sense in which you did and a sense in which you didn't. When he says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, God didn't go in there and change the quality and the character. You read about this Pharaoh, he was a stubborn ox. He was a bad man who was enslaving and brutalizing the people of God. God hardened his heart and he hardened his own. And God did it from the outside, giving perceived parallel power, giving a respite even within his sin. There are those living in sin right now and within the respite, they won't hear your word. So many times they won't hear your word until the thing they take trust in is taken from them. And then they'll come and say, I, I, I need Jesus. And then when their life gets good again, what do they do again? They go right back to it. How many hearts are hardened by a respite within sin? Answer number three. How does God harden hearts? All through the ministry of Jesus, Jesus spoke in parables. And I, I heard this years ago when I first started preaching. Somebody said, Daniel, Jesus always spoke at an elementary level in his lessons. So when you preach, you need to basically preach at an elementary level, like fifth grade level. So Jesus always spoke in a way that even kids could understand. The only problem with that is, that's not what Jesus said about why he spoke in parables. Jesus said this. The disciples came to him. They said, why are you speaking in parables? Listen to what he actually said about why he was doing it. This is, in, this is in Matthew 13. He said, this is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they don't see. And hearing they don't hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says... You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. Jesus spoke in such a way that a fifth grader could understand the story, but a scholar who'd studied his Bible his whole life and had it memorized backwards and forwards could walk away not knowing at all the point of the lesson. That's why he did it. And the point is, 
God didn't hand us his word on a silver platter. You can open up this book and you can get lost in it. You can read Romans and you can get lost in it. Go try to read Revelation. You can get lost in it. So many people come to it and they think that just isn't worth my time. They hear the story and they say, I heard what you said. Doesn't really change anything for me. I'm going to go about my life as I was before. That's one way that God hardens hearts. He didn't give it to us direct. He demanded some digging. And if you question that, the disciples who heard the stories oftentimes came to Jesus and they said, why? Not only why are you speaking in perils, but, but oftentimes they said, what did you mean by that? And Jesus had to give them the answers. He spoke in such a way that the only way you could get the answer was to seek him out afterwards. If you didn't seek him out, you wouldn't get the answer. That's how he hardens hearts. Because Jesus describes a hard heart. What did we say a hard heart was? Unseeing, unhearing, not able to think. It's exactly what Jesus said, the reason why he did what he did. And lastly this morning, number four. Listen to this word from 1 Corinthians 1. Paul says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Now, now, hear this. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are being called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Many years ago on Facebook, one of my friends from high school made his Facebook, um, not his status, but his little description about himself. The description said, Christians just worship a dead Jew on a stick. And I saw it and I, I reached out to him and I said, you need to take that down. And he did. Thankfully. He wasn't meaning that nicely. When he looks at the Christian faith, that's all he sees. You mean to tell me that the world is going to be saved by this? That's, that's not what we want to see. Why do we like Marvel so much? Which, by I, I hate Marvel. They're, it's the same story every single time. But... Why, why do people like Marvel so much and all these superheroes so much? They want to see the bronze, the muscle, the defeat of the enemy from the giant dragon or the giant enemy and it to be obliterated and blown up with nuclear bombs and all of these cool gadgets and this crazy action that's constant. That's what they want to see. But you're telling me that The way God saved the world is by this man who was unattractive, who's dripping in blood with a crown of thorns as the crowd mocks him and his hands are spread out and there's nails through him and he's hanging and he's struggling to breathe and he's hung between two criminals and he dies and he gets buried in a tomb. You mean to tell me that's how he saves the world? To so many, that is utter foolishness and it pleased, the, it pleased God to save the world through the very means they would find foolish because he came to destroy our wisdom. This is how God hardens hearts. God does it. Now, I want to finish like this. So God hardens the hearts of unbelievers who see a parallel power in whatever they're doing. He hardens the hearts of people by giving them a respite within their sin. He hardens, so you may be living in sin right now and everything seems to be going fine. Don't let that harden your heart. Just because you've got money in the bank, don't let that harden your heart. That's what they did. This is here so we can learn it. 
Don't, don't shut down the message because it isn't a come to church, leave feeling really good kind of thing. Learn from Israel and be wise unto salvation. That's the point. But I do have a really good word to finish this out. And I want you to hear this because this is amazing. Of these very people who's, who's given a spirit of stupor, eyes that couldn't see, ears that couldn't hear, in the same chapter, here's where Paul goes with it. We're going to look at this in detail in a few weeks, but I want you to see it now. In verse 23, Paul says, even they, that very group, if they don't continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. They were cut off because of unbelief, hardened in their hearts, but they don't have to continue that way. And if they don't continue, God will graft them right back in. I know those who've gone off and they've lived reckless, wild lives, having known before the right way, and years later came back and said, I chose the wrong path. That's what the prodigal is about. Somebody that knew better and had a hard heart and thought money would solve it, and he learned it wasn't. God's able to graft them in again. That's the power and the grace of God. And then one more quick scripture. Jesus, when he quoted this, listen to this. When he quoted the blind, hard-hearted people, he said, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. It says, you'll, you'll indeed hear, but never understand. You'll indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they've closed. Now listen, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. God stood with his arms out all day long to Israel, calling them, and he does the same today. The word this morning is don't be hardened by a perceived power that exists in whatever you're currently doing because it's not as great as the power of God. I promise you that. Don't be hardened by having a place of peace within your sin and thinking that that means that you're okay. Don't be hardened by hearing hard words and saying, I won't listen because I want them to be at a fifth grade level. Because as long as you come here, as long as I'm here, they probably won't be. So I need you to stay with me. And lastly, don't be hardened by the folly of the cross as the world keeps calling it foolish. This is how God saves. It's the aroma of life, and we love it. And anybody who hears this word and who wakes up from their sleep and comes to Jesus, there is salvation through faith, and there's salvation in no other name. And we'll stand on that till Jesus comes again. Let's stand and sing.